Welcome everyone. You are uh, now attending our webinar. This is a webinar hosted by the Federation of American Scientists. It's titled Shaping Our Priorities for the Bioeconomy, How Definitions Matter in a Bio-Based World. Um, I am Sarah Carter. I'm a senior fellow here at FAS, uh, where I focus on the bioeconomy. Um, I'm joined also by my colleague at FAS, Najish Jeffrey, uh, who is the bioeconomy policy manager here. The purpose of this webinar is to try to start uh, broaden the discussion about the definitions for the bioeconomy and how they relate to sustainability. We're at a really important point for the bioeconomy, an important point in time. The U.S. government is getting more organized on this topic, particularly as it relates to the executive order that came out last September on biomanufacturing and biotechnology. And one of the key things that that executive order called for was to create a definition, a definition for the bioeconomy so that the U.S. government can track and set policy and evaluate their policy related to the bioeconomy. This is also about the future of the bioeconomy and to what extent will it include sustainability. And all of these issues are connected to each other and will be a part of the discussion today. For this webinar, we are going to first, we'll have some uh, opening remar remarks from Dr. Highfill, who's at the Department of Commerce, um, and then I will moderate a discussion uh, thereafter with the panelists. So I'm excited to introduce our uh, our panelists. First will, is Dr. Tina Highfill. She, she is a senior research economist at the Bureau of Economic Analysis, BEA, which is part of the U.S. Department of Commerce. Dr. Heifel leads research for high-profile and multifaceted economic analyses, including several that originated from U.S. Congress. Her work at BEA includes co-authoring the recent report, Developing a National Measure of the Economic Contributions of the Bioeconomy, which we'll be hearing more about uh, in this webinar. Um, I also want to welcome Matthew Chambers, who is co-author on that same report. Dr. Hanny Rivera is an Associate Director of Business Development at Ginkgo Bioworks, a leading synthetic biology platform company. In her role, she helps develop partnerships and new synthetic biology approaches to create more sustainable products across industries, including chemicals, agriculture, mining, and pharma. Uh, and our, our third panelist is Teal Brown Zimbring, who is a political economist and nature-based solutions strategist with specialized expertise in wildfire, biomass economies, and market-based approaches to conservation. She is executive director of Lab to Land Institute, which is an organization built to understand and unlock the potential of biotechnologies to accelerate climate resilience and conservation outcomes for threatened ecosystems. Uh, she is also managing partner of Galvanize Partners, a policy and economic strategy consulting firm. So uh, with that, we're going to turn over to Dr. Tina Highfill for some uh, some sort of uh, opening remarks to tell us about her report and to, to lay the groundwork for some of our discussions about the definitions of the, of the bioeconomy. Uh, Dr. Highfill. We are seeing your slides and they look great. Thank you for having me. My name is Tina Highfill. I'm excited to be here today. Uh, I'll be discussing a feasibility report that I wrote with my colleague, Matthew Chambers. We're both research economists at the Bureau of Economic Analysis. If you're not familiar with the BEA, we produce many of the official economic statistics for the United States, uh, most notably gross domestic product or GDP. Before we get into measuring the bioeconomy, how does the government measure the U.S. economy? Uh, and so here I have a chart from our most recent press release, which shows uh, change in real GDP by industry group. Uh, so when we talk about the economy, we're talking about production of goods and services. So these are market transactions. And we typically think about these in terms of standard industry classifications that you can see there on the left-hand side of this chart. So healthcare spending, retail trade, agriculture, things like that. So these are kind of our core accounts. And this is what we think about when we, we're talking about the economy. So of course, there's parts of the economy that don't fall into these specific buckets, such as the digital economy or, of course, the bioeconomy. So the bioeconomy, as you all know, can span um, not just healthcare, but agriculture, government, and things like that. And so when BEA was directed in the executive uh, order to think about how would we measure the bioeconomy, we the first step is to think about, well, what is the bioeconomy? Uh, so in the executive order, 
the bioeconomy was defined broadly as economic activity derived from the life sciences, particularly in the areas of biotechnology and biomanufacturing. Uh, so that's a pretty broad definition. Uh, and so we, you know, this was our starting point. Uh, and then, of course, we looked at existing research. Within the United States, there are two good reports or areas to look at. First is USDA, U.S. Department of Agriculture. They have uh, been thinking about the bioeconomy uh, for a long time, and they have what are called bio-based product reports and bioindicator reports. There is also a recent report from the uh, National Academies uh, about the bioeconomy as well. And so uh, we looked at what how do those uh, groups define the bioeconomy? So we have this little Venn diagram that shows the products that they uh, these groups included in their reports. And so you can see there is some overlap, bio-based chemical products, plastics, bioenergy, but there's a lot of areas where there's not overlap. The USDA, probably as expected, includes things like crop farming, forestry, textile products, uh, whereas the National Academies focused more on biotechnology products, so biotechnology R&D, pharmaceuticals, and things like that. Uh, so we already know that there's some kind of divergent ways of thinking about the bioeconomy. And then we also looked internationally and in, in private industry reports, and that's what's on the right uh, hand side of this chart, where if some people consider the bioeconomy in a very broad sense to include all of agriculture, food and beverages, furniture, leather, and things like that. And so the, the takeaway is that there's not one definition of the bioeconomy as it stands right now. The last slide here I have for you, my colleague Matthew put this together. This shows kind of three visions um, that explain why there are these different ways to think about the bioeconomy. So biotechnology is, is often one way to think about the bioeconomy. So this relates to kind of research and technology versus bioresources, which is um, more related to processes that use biomass or biological products. And then we have this third vision um, related to bioecology, which really focuses on sustainability and biodiversity. And so in our report, we kind of summarize that if we were at BEA to try and measure the bioeconomy, we'd really need to understand what is the um, goal. You know, do we want to focus just on biotechnology or do we want to have a really broad vision and and really include all of these things? And from our point of view at BEA, when we're thinking about, you know, the goods and services that are that make up the entire U.S. economy. It's really, do we have the data to do these things? So it would actually be easier if we wanted to do a broad-based, include all of agriculture, all of healthcare. Uh, but we realize that's not necessarily what our data users are thinking. Uh, and so it really depends on data availability and the definition that our data users are interested in before we can kind of continue with this type of project. Uh, so I'll just stop there. And I'll pass it back to Sarah. Thank you so much for that overview. Um, it, one of the things that you mentioned uh, was about the goals. What's the goal of the definition? And, and I do sort of want to start there with our other panelists. Um, and the question there is, why does it matter what, how we define the, the bioeconomy? You know, in what ways does it affect that? You know, the future, whether that be economic activity, policy making, harmonization with international systems. You know, what what difference does that make? And I, I'm going to call on Teal first, but I'd also like to hear from Hanny. Go ahead, Teal. To answer your question, let's see, why does it matter? What we do now, of course, creates path dependencies for the legislation, the allocation of finances, those things we incentivize, innovations, how investors show up, how innovators show up with what it is that they're encouraged to research at the earliest stages. So I think, you know, why does it matter is, is truly substantial. But I think some of the ways that we can think about it, and you do a good, great job of highlighting this in the report, are things like what we enable or disable in supply chains by creating ways to enable or disable collaboration across nations or across existing economies, where and how we shape public perception about the future of this economy and of this work, um, which I think is really deeply meaningful, especially as we think about the bioeconomy being comprehensive of existing large industries, potentially forestry, agriculture, et cetera, but also industries that are not only nascent, but at times fraught with complexity. And so public perception will matter and supply chains will matter. Um, and how finances flow will matter. And I think from my perspective, another piece that matters quite a bit is that we have very few 
opportunities, and Tina and Matthew, you can correct me on this if I'm wrong here, to define new economies as they emerge, which we believe to be economies that will have truly substantial impact across many, many sectors. We're doing so today with more knowledge about climate change, more knowledge about sustainability, more knowledge about the reality of the, of the world that we're marching in and toward than we have in the past. And so the other reason it really matters is that we have an opportunity right now to possibly rethink uh, some components of how we bring externalities into the definition uh, in a way we haven't had an opportunity to do in the past. Okay, thanks, Teal. Uh, Hanny, uh, what is your perspective on that? Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for for joining, and and thank you, Sarah and, and Nazi, for organizing. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I uh, absolutely agree with everything that that Teal said, and especially on that last point, I think it's it's really important to think about this from a from a holistic perspective, especially. Um, as we're, we're talking about here, right, like how does sustainability and sort of overall environmental awareness play into the role of the bioeconomy for the future? Um, and I think in, in one way in which the definition matters is, is also that thinking about how we define the bioeconomy, as, as Teal mentioned, right, will then sort of kind of direct and guide where the resources, where the innovation, where the kind of scientific uh, push might happen within that sector. And I think we should be thinking about a, a, a definition and uh, an effort that makes sure make sure that we we take the kind of more sustainable practices that we might have currently, as well as promote and develop the more sustainable practices that could be brought about through biotechnology or bioecology or, or, or bio resources or any of the other potential sort of groupings that could fall into uh, bioeconomy, um, because I, I think if we define it in such a way that we're we're looking towards the the sector that or, or the places that we have the most ability to innovate and do things differently, then we are potentially giving ourselves the best chance to really kind of move away from the status quo, from the way that things are done, and and make the bioeconomy as sustainable as possible, as opposed to kind of putting a really wide looking kind of backwards umbrella that then just encompasses most of what we've been doing and sort of then kind of negates the promise of the bioeconomy as a way to move away from, a, you know, unsustainable fossil fuel driven kind of economic chain. So that's kind of my two cents there. Yeah, you outlined that sort of vision about, about sustainability, but I, I do want to ask actually the same two of you, Teal and Hanny, both about the intersections between the between biotechnologies and sustainability. Um, it, it, it's obvious that a significant segment of the bioeconomy hopes to, to offer products that help with some environmental problems or that offer improvements in sustainability or, or directly reduce uh, you know, carbon dioxide uh, you know, in the atmosphere or all kinds of different solutions. Do you think that sustainability really is a central component of the bioeconomy? And, and so to what extent should we think of them as intertwined or is, or is it important to keep them more separate? Uh, sure. And Hanny, I'll repeat or I'll, I'll repeat something Hanny shared because I think it's a good jumping off point for the question, Sarah, that you asked, which is um, negate the promise. And I think um, I sort of I share that perspective. And also it's something we have to think about as we move forward with the with regard to do we collectively agree that there is a promise within the bioeconomy of a pathway away from dependency on fossil fuels, of a pathway toward incentivizing sustainability? I certainly think that there is that possibility and that the overlap is substantial and that to the degree we can codify that promise, it's something we have to do um, and that is critically important. So I just wanna underscore um, the use of that language. Bioeconomy, products are not necessarily inherently sustainable. You could use that input output definition. And I think it was the, the second of the visions and not necessarily be incentivizing something that we might define as sustainable. And so it's a really, really important question. You know, how narrow does the aperture get? And does that then limit the value of our definition when it comes to lawmaking or funding? Do we miss the opportunity and we negate that promise? Um, I could answer a little on the scientific side, although I think I should leave that to Hanny with regard to where the promise may lie. Things like use of waste feedstocks, shifting away from yeasts and sugars all the way to, you know, how we define the things uh, that we measure. But Hanny, I know you have more expertise in that space than I do. 
Um, yeah, Teal, I, I think I, I 100% agree with you that, you know, not everything in the bioeconomy is inherently sustainable. And I think that's something that if we want the bioeconomy, right, if we, if the vision and the goal and the, the dream of the bioeconomy is to have it be a sort of a sustainable alternative to our current kind of economic model and, and, and manufacturing model, then we should be thinking very carefully about how to both promote the parts of the bioeconomy that can be really sustainable, things like you mentioned, having, you know, waste feedstocks, biodegradable uh, materials, using biology along with traditional chemistries to strengthen things, to make them last longer, to make them more diverse and versatile, as well as, you know, still necessarily walking away from other parts of the bioeconomy that could be really helpful, but might not be the most sustainable if you do a full life cycle analysis. But thinking also about how to how to convert those parts of the bioeconomy there, they're still very necessary. You know, say something like like agriculture or uh, even you know like cattle agriculture or things like that. Like how to convert those into more sustainable um, industries through biotechnology as well. So I think there there's kind of both sides of the coin. There are, there are practices within the bioeconomy as broadly as we might want to define it currently that could certainly use increases in sustainability. There are other practices that are inherently more sustainable, and we should be promoting the, the development and the expansion of those, as well as kind of trying to put both on the path towards a, a more sustainable future, in my opinion. These, sound, these are very big topics, and they're very um, complex topics. When you talk about sustainability, I, you know, just even I fear that if we are trying to start to define the bioeconomy and we want to include sustainability, <laughs> at some point we may need to define sustainability. And, and I, um, I know that that can be its own challenge, uh, it, perhaps as big or bigger than defining bioeconomy. Um, yes. <laughs> um, but uh, before we, we we dig into that a little bit more, I, or before we ask that question, I do want to ask um, Tina about what what a meaningful, measurable definition could include or exclude. You know, some of these things seem to be very, you know. Um, nebulous, some things are very, you know, specific. And so it just in, in terms of the, the kinds of things that that the Department of Commerce already measures, what what is easy to include and what is hard to include? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, so the, the way that um, we measure the overall economy is uh, we, not the EA, but the government collects information from companies on the types of products that they produce. Um, and how much revenue they they get by selling those products uh, in the case of market transactions or in the case of like nonprofits and R&D where it's not necessarily sold on the market. Um, we get information on how much they spend on it. And so uh, it's really a measure of spending. Um, and so the government collections are typically, they take a long time to update. Uh, so we have really detailed information. We do a census of all businesses. So every business in the United States is, should get um, a, a census questionnaire every five years asking this information, like how much money do you make? What products are you making? And then in those intervening five years, we have surveys so that we're not bothering every business every single year. Um, we kind of fill in the blanks. But that every five years is important because that's the kind of benchmark we use to gather really detailed information on products. And I, I bring this up because there's this lag when we're come when we're thinking about new products. And so when Teal and Hanny were talking about sustainability and, and new products, I think that would be frankly the hardest thing to measure because government collections really lag in terms of getting um, in updated information on products. And, and I'll note that as part of the executive order, there's a, a working group was um, put together to think about how can we update government collections as well. So there, all, a lot of things have to happen um, for us to be able to measure new products and new technologies. Um, and so just to, to wrap it up, the, the way that we measure the economy, so we gather, we have information on all of the products um, produced and consumed in the United States based on company level information. That's the, that's the short story. <laughs> uh, but, but it, you know, it occurs to me that that, the, just that product based sort of, of data collection and the company based data collection, you know, it, it does, it doesn't account for a lot of the externalities, you know, as that Teal mentioned and many of the, the, and other types of societal benefits, you know, not just sustainability, but a wide range. 
how can we better capture social benefits? The US government and their data collection it seems unlikely or, or they currently do not uh, capture those things very well. But I'm, I'm wondering if there are other examples or other types of ways that people have thought about where we can capture those externalities. I'm, I'm going to ask this to, um, to Hanny uh, first, but then also um, to Teal. And, but Tina, let me know if you want to jump in with any ways that the U.S. government is thinking about this as well. But so, so Hanny, so the question is how, are there other areas or other places or other sectors where, where economists or others have been able to capture those kinds of externalities for their products? Um, I'm actually not sure if I have the most uh, technical expertise on this front, um, but I guess just sort of quickly hearkening back to not my current role, but some of my previous uh, work and my technical background was largely in thinking about coral reef ecosystems, for instance. And so I think in, in the realm of sort of nature-based solutions and, and sort of bioecology sort of as kind of a, a definition here. There has certainly been fields and, and, and disciplines and economists looking into how to value sort of the, the resources and the services that ecosystems and natural products can provide. They are, you know, sort of very imperfect methods and, and largely estimating and, and sort of calculating things like tourism GDP or protection from storms or kind of watershed buffering, things like that. And so I think there's still a lot that is not very well understood of how to really quantify that value and, and things that might be more, I guess, elusive, like biodiversity or harder to track or measure or really understand the, the sort of how does that translate into benefit for society. I think in, in terms of just coming back to like products themselves and, and sort of the earlier conversations, I think one of the frameworks that could be useful here is um, currently, right, there's a huge push for carbon accounting and, and carbon markets and, and verifying sort of if companies can track their carbon footprint and how to account for that in their supply chains. Um, there are sort of different levels of impact, which are termed scope one to scope four, sort of in layers of, of externalities away from the company. So if I make pen, the resources that I use to make that pen, the raw materials, those are my scope one emissions. If that then gets used in a way that emits you know, some CO2, then that's the scope two emission and then sort of end of life kind of recycling is more further down the line and so forth. And so I think there, there, there is a lot of thinking currently about how to start folding those into uh, economic thinking. But I think we still, to my knowledge, and, and Tina, please feel free to chime in here. There isn't really quite a way yet to, to sort of fold it in holistically in terms of like the values of goods and services, right? Like we have been tracking kind of global carbon emissions and, and things like that, but it's still at a very coarse level. I don't think we have the really tools or methods or even the, the validation techniques to track those at a, you know, really fine tuned product level for companies and different sort of sectors of the economy. Well, it strikes me that there's a lot of uncertainty and innovation in this space right now about how to even capture these things. And, and those methods are not well established, perhaps in any sector. In part, I'm sure because of the challenges um, in doing so, that it's a complex question to ask about the externalities of a, you know, of a product, of a pen. <laughs> um, and uh, I think that's that could be part of the challenge here. Uh, Teal, did you have uh, anything to add on that? As you said, Sarah, this is incredibly complex and also critically important. And it's almost like this, um, I'm imagining kind of a clamping mechanism in my head. We have to use market forces to drive sustainable outcomes in small scale projects in all of the things that we do when we are aiming for sustainable outcomes and aiming for the demonstration of new and different products to do new and better things, which we'll call sustainable. At the same time, we wanna codify that at some federal translatable level that can move across governments, that can move across agencies, while we're figuring it out at the ground level with these subscale projects that are trying to demonstrate what could be possible with these new technologies. Or, or new, you know, new economic approaches. And, um, and so with carbon scope accounting, or you see nature loss risk, dis risk disclosures, TNFD coming out of COP15, a theory in which uh, companies would start to disclose uh, what of their, what vulnerabilities they have in their supply chain that cause nature loss, or as nature is lost, what might be vulnerable in their supply chains, and this affects GDP. And so we 
you know, how might we account for that with big companies? And then there's others coming out now. Could we place a price on biodiversity? Um, systemic, there's some interesting companies looking at how might we quantify um, these other values or externalities. And those are really important processes to try to determine how might we account for externalities. And then at the same time, it's complicated because it's a little bit of like a race to the bottom to try to get to a perfect shared equal definition where we all agree on how the I is dotted and the T is crossed. But in the meantime, we want to be advancing sustainable bioeconomy while we work on how to get to some shared definition. So for what it is worth, that's not really an answer, but rather just a, a greater perspective on the complexity. And I, I do think there's substantial investment from a lot of really smart, interesting folks right now on scope uh, clarity for, for carbon accounting um, and on NFD, nature law risk disclosures or biodiversity. We might even look to things like congestion pricing. Mm -hmm. That's a place where we internalized an externality by placing a price on a consumer when there's more people on the road. I don't know exactly how we translate that in, but we have done this in other sectors. We are doing it with a lot of sophisticated minds um, around carbon and biodiversity. So for what that's worth, it'll be interesting to see how we can continue to learn at the cutting edge of the accounting, even given that five-year lag that you mentioned, Tina. Teal, you mentioned that we do need, you know, some, we do need a real definition. We need to be able to move forward now, even while we're trying to figure out these things. You know, it's sort of, you know, the the building the airplane as you begin to fly it kind of effect. Um, but I, I, it will be, it makes me wonder about how how durable a government definition is, or if you can build in, you know, some flexibility into the future. How often can a definition like this be updated, or, or do we have to choose now, you know, for the rest of time? Or how does that work, and how is that? Um, what is that process like? Definitions can absolutely change. Whenever we're thinking about measuring some type of phenomenon, um, we typically like to have some specificity, but also to keep it open so that we're not missing kind of future innovations. The The idea behind having a definition is so we have somewhere to start because it's easier to, uh, you know, that way we're not just cherry picking certain products without some type of framework. And I, I want to note that uh, this question about externality and measuring externalities is an interesting one. And I'd like to throw it over to my colleague, Matthew. He's an environmental economist to kind of uh, give a little bit more background if uh, if I may. But let me just note that uh, at BEA, we, like I mentioned, we produce macroeconomic statistics. We do this under a framework that's used around the world. It's called the System of National Accounts. And the idea is for for us to come up with statistics using a grounded framework uh, so that we can compare the U.S. economy to France's economy to China's economy. And so we're all kind of comparing the same thing. But with that said, we we realize that there's other ways to measure social benefits, things like that, that are outside of the scope of what GDP really captures. And so we're, we're very well aware of that. So we're not trying to say that only market production matters. Uh, it's just that's what we do. And it's a way for us to say, how does this uh, contribute to our economy using kind of these standard statistics that we produce. So we're not saying it's not important just because we don't measure it. And so uh, I'll stop here to see if Matthew, would you like to add anything uh, about measuring externalities? Um, just just to kind of, uh, I guess, mostly agree with what Hanny, a lot of what Hanny said kind of summarized is not a, a settled sort of area, you know, even for any one pollutant, uh, even, you know, even if you just take greenhouse gases, even if you just take um, fine particulate matter, those are both air pollutants, uh, let alone every other, you know, possible externality that there is, right? Um, but even even within greenhouse gases, even within PM 2.5, it's not, it's just not settled how to quantify all of the costs. There are some, I'm not saying we don't know anything because we do, right? But like, we, we can't say we have figured it out. We know how much harm this causes, right? I mean, the environmental economists are always publishing new papers, finding uh, new harm. It's, it's not a trivial question. And like Tina said, you know, from official government statistics, we want people to, to be able to trust that, that where we're going from is a very solid, um, well-based definition. Yeah, we, we, I'm wondering if, uh, if Hanny or Teal have a reaction to any of that. This gets a little bit back to the why does the definition matter <laughs> question. You know, does it have to be a government definition? Can it be, you know, a government definition with additional analysis put on top of it? Thinking about risk, you know, externalities relate not just to what we're trying to incentivize, but to, to what we are placing at risk. 
is there a measure of risk that is currently taken into account substantially within BEA definitions for other satellite accounts, given that it's measured primarily uh, on dollars, uh, products, jobs, uh, if I understood correctly? I'm curious your take, uh, Matthew and Tina, almost sorry, Sarah, putting it back, but to the point of, you know, how does the definition matter? To what degree do we currently calculate risk as a component in the, in the definition? Well, we don't measure risk. Uh, we, uh, unless it's something traded in the market that I, that I can't think of right now. Uh, so this, you know, it has to be something that's kind of bought and sold. Um, and the idea is to kind of measure the economic uh, production capacity of a country. Um, and so in, in the sense that risk isn't really traded, um, not in the way, if I'm understanding correctly, then it's not uh, necessarily a component of, of our statistics. Um, one example, so we, we have uh, statistics on outdoor recreation. So this is, um, you know, another example of an area of the economy that spans multiple different industries. So there's, um, you know, manufacturing of boats, but then there's also a, a lot of other things like government production, the, the Department of the Interior and things like that. Uh, and so when we were coming up with these definitions of what is outdoor recreation, there was a big question about, well, what about the benefits that people get from going to a park or, or taking a walk, you know, or a bike ride? And it's just outside of the scope of, of the macroeconomic statistics that we produce. And so the way we think about it is the, uh, the statistics we come up with are almost kind of the um, floor you know, to kind of here's the economic co contribution uh, when we're talking about direct production. Um, and then other researchers uh, in academics and things like that, I think, can build off of what we do is kind of how I think about our statistics. Yeah, Tina, one thing that you you mentioned uh, that I want to pull on a little bit is is international comparisons. So, uh, you know, the, the sort of the product based, the, you know, GDP measurements that the U.S. makes are meant to be comparable around the world. Uh, but I know that around the world, there have also been other ideas about what the bioeconomy is. Um, you know, the EU has a very different uh, definition of this. And it's and it's not just about the bioeconomy, but also about sustainability and how to measure it and, and what that looks like. But I'm, I'm wondering, uh, well, for, actually, I think I will push it to you first, Tina. I know that in the, the kind of definitions that you laid out in your report, there are some that came from other countries. And, and um, if you could just give us a just very brief idea about how the definitions in other countries differ than what we are thinking about within the US. So there's um, there's an EU report and then there are reports from individual countries and they kind of vary depending on the country. And uh, so countries, for example, that have a lot of forests will tend to want to include all their forest material, furniture made from wood, uh, uh, things like that. And the, you know, the motivation for a lot of these countries to come out with these reports is to really show to the, the biggest degree the impact of this one specific industry to the overall economy. And so I get the impression, got the impression when I was reading these reports that a lot of the, uh, th there wasn't really an interest in trying to be comparable internationally. It was more about trying to focus and highlight a specific part of that country's specific product. And so countries that maybe don't produce a lot of raw goods, but people will come to visit their beaches or, you know, jungles or things like that, they would have uh, a really broad definition to include nature tourism, which seemed really outside of the scope of kind of what the impression I got from the United States standpoint. So it really, uh, there's actually a chart in, in um, I think, one of the EU reports where it's literally every country in the EU, and then there's a list of products, and then there's an X on who includes what, and it's really all over the place. And so I think it really depends on, as we said at the very beginning, what the motivation is for, you know, kind of trying to quantify this for each country. Right. And it's interesting that that could be part of the goal of the definition as well, is in sort of for any given country to put their best foot forward. Yeah, Hanny or Teal, do, do either of you want to add anything about comparing the U.S. definitions of the bioeconomy uh, to other countries? I, you know, it, I think it, it sort of kind of 
harkens back to some of the earlier conversations from the initial question around what is sort of the the purpose of the definition. And and I think for, in my personal opinion, right, thinking about the promise and, and the role of the bioeconomy in, in the future going forward for different countries to sort of include different parts of their economy to sort of touch upon biology or bioeconomic things. I think to the, to the extent that those activities in those sectors are sort of promoting environmental stewardship and, and management, right, to, in, in my personal opinion, and, and I'm kind of taking off any sort of ginkgo hat here, just thinking as as my kind of ecologist background, like I see that as, as sort of a positive, but it does sort of muddy the waters and make things a little bit more complicated if we are thinking about the bioeconomy as like an economic driving sector about jobs and technology and research and development. And so um, I can see why there's a desire and a reason to include things like you know, nature tourism in that definition for countries that have those resources and are working towards safeguarding them. From the, the U.S. perspective, um, what I have seen as, you know, part of a company that is obviously very active in this sector is that I think there are there are a lot of ways in which biotechnology in particular, kind of taking a, a slightly different slice at the bioeconomy definition here, there are a lot of ways in which biotechnology can be applied across a variety of sectors for a number of different applications. And so I think that to the extent that biotechnology as a burgeoning research area is really kind of important for U.S research and development for U.S. to maintain um, kind of a, a leading edge in the technology and the, the resources that we offer the world, I think it is important to sort of take this kind of broad brush here too on the biotechnology front because we really can apply it in so many different ways, right, from pharmaceuticals to uh even environmental restoration to chemicals all, all across the board. I think the big thing is the opportunity to learn from those who have defined it prior to us for reasons that had economic incentives within their own nations, be it tourism or otherwise. But we do have every incentive to lean in the biotechnology direction given our leading edge. So Sounds good. I, I'm now going to go to uh, some of our, our questions from viewers. Uh, I'm actually going to call on my FAS colleague, uh, Nazish, to sort through those. Of course. Um, I think since we're talking about international definitions and what the bioeconomy looks like in these different perspectives, I think we can, you know, go a step further and talk about there's obviously a need to better characterize and standardize the bioeconomy and the associated activity globally. The question kind of becomes, is it your sense that a UN body might have a role in achieving something like a consensus? Is there a more appropriate institutional factor that would be appropriate for this? Or will consensus have to emerge more organically? An interesting question about top-down or, or community-based. Uh, uh, Tina, go ahead. Thank you. This is, this is a good question. Uh, so I mentioned earlier that BEA uses an international uh, system of national accounts framework that allows us to have comparable statistics across the world. That's actually a UN body um, that produces that manual, the SNAs. And so if we were to try and get serious about, you know, every country doing this in the same way, having that come from the UN, come from the system of national accounts would be the right approach. That way we can all, the way it works is every few years, countries get together, statistical agencies from around the world, and we kind of think about how do we do these things? You know, um, how are we measuring these new technologies, these new innovations? And should we change the way that we classify things? Should we change the way we collect data? Uh, and so if we wanted to really get comparable statistics, that would absolutely be the right approach, I think. And and I'll also note that the United States in the past has uh, come up with satellite accounts, come up with these different measurements and, and put out a definition that were used by other countries. Uh, sometimes somebody just has to do it and then other countries will follow along, uh, maybe with some tweaks, but still, you know, close enough that it's comparable. Uh, so that is another reason why in the, the United States we take these definitions so seriously because it's something that may proliferate uh, in the future to other countries as well. That sounds like another way the U.S. can be a leader in this area and to try to pull the rest of the world in a, a U.S. Um, favorable direction. Yeah, to follow up on that, I guess, since we're on the international talks right now, do you think there is a bigger role for inter international cooperation and collaboration as we work towards a global bioeconomy together? Right now, it feels like the EU tends to be a little bit more insulated than what the U.S. is achieving and performing on right now. Does it make sense for us to start collaborating on a larger scale? Is that back to me? Or I I'd love to see if Hanny or Teal have anything to say on, on international cooperation. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I will pose that question a little to Hanny. Like, I know that Ginkgo Bioworks does work internationally and has been, you know, tries to establish a lot of partnerships that way. 
I mean, Hanny, I, do you, what do you think? Yeah, I think there's, there's certainly a, a big role for international cooperation and international research and development um, to help drive not just the, the technology that we need to make the bioeconomy a reality, but also to sort of connect biological technologies to different parts of the supply chain. Um, right currently, we have very global supply chains, and if we're going to try and move towards more biologically based products, it's not just going to be the United States that needs to make changes. It's going to be every sort of country thinking about how to use biology within their raw material production, within their manufacturing, within their um, sort of end of life uh, reprocessing and recycling um, to convert that entire kind of life cycle into a more hopefully you know sustainable, reusable uh, alternative. So I think there's absolutely a role for for collaboration. I think there's also a, a big role in terms of how going back to like how different countries kind of measure their their bioeconomy in thinking about how biology, whether that's in the form of biotechnology or some of the other bioresources, how it can help countries move towards like better standards of living, better products, you know, lower pollution, better things for their populations as well, and, and sort of collaborating within uh, between countries to make that actually a realistic future for, for everyone. Yeah. I won't, I won't actually go down the sort of other kind of aspect of this because it hasn't really been part of the, the biotechnology definitions that we've been talking about, but a, a large part of, of Ginkgo's more international collaborations are around the, around the topic of biosurveillance and how do you actually use biotechnology to ensure that, you know, we stay abreast of uh, emerging pathogens and sort of public health risks. Um, but given the time, I won't, I won't detour us on that, but that's also a really important, obvious uh, topic for international collaboration. We all just came out of many years of, of public health health uh, scares and, and pandemic. So I don't think anyone's eager to repeat that. Um, and that's a really obvious a way for, for countries to collaborate for, for the for the better and the good of everyone on, on that front. I, uh, I, I kind of want to shift this discussion a little bit more to the U.S. based side of things now and looking th at things regionally. Because so we've looked at, you know, the international level and we've looked at the national level, level but obviously the bioeconomy and the definitions are going to have a huge impact on regions. And given that the um, definition of the bioeconomy is extremely broad, it's kind of anticipated that we'd see regional bioeconomy definitions fragmenting from the national one, which ends up creating these like little specific niches within these regions. So how could we make and help make these regional focus standards in order to foster these regionally strong bioeconomies in the U.S.? Yeah. Tina, that's a question for you in part, um, unless others want to chime in. But I'm wondering, Tina, to what extent does the Department of Commerce track those regional or state by state kinds of economic activity? Uh, so we produce national and state and county level statistics, met metropolitan area as well. Typically with these uh, satellite accounts, these kind of standalone accounts, we start at the national level. We try to get a, a good definition, a good base for how we're going to measure it at the national level because we have better data typically at the national level. And then if there's interest and data availability, we will go down to the state level. So we do stick with a standard definition, even when we go down to the state level. But the way that we see kind of how this plays out in different regions is different states produce different things. And so it's possible that even if we have one definition for the U.S. bioeconomy, the California bioeconomy may be very different because it's possible that they have a lot more biotechnology focus versus states maybe in, in the middle of the United States, which might have more bioresources because of farming and, and things like that. Uh, so it would really play out differently depending on what the state specializes in but we would we typically do keep the same definition generally speaking, when we go between nation and, and different states. Uh, Nazish, we might have time for one more question from the audience, if there is if there's a good one. Yeah, I think um, to bring us back and kind of uh, close the circle, looking at what is the purpose of a definition? What is the purpose of these visions that we have for bioeconomy? How could another layer of end uses help clarify the, uh, the framework written within the BA that you've expanded on a little bit, Tina? For example, like biotechnology for health versus manufacturing, bioresources, um, um, for fuel versus consumer goods. Is that type of added complexity going to be beneficial to a definition or is it going to be not helpful? I think it would be very helpful to to have more clarity uh, on, on end uses because um, it's the definition gives us a framework and then we have to find data. Uh, so even if we have a perfect definition, if we don't have the data, then we, we won't have a good measure.
there. And so understanding end uses, um, I think, like you mentioned, bio biomanufacturing with regard to uh, health or, or different areas, that would help us be able to identify different data sources. Um, and so I think that that would be very useful to have clarification. So we one way to do that is to start with kind of a broad definition, like the one in the executive order, and then get really specific, you know, on, on what we mean by that. And end uses is the perfect way to do that because that's what a product is. It's it's a final thing. And so I think if I'm understanding the, the question correctly, I think that would be really helpful to get clarification on end uses to for, for measurement purposes. End uses, you know, we talked a lot about externalities and sort of what went into a product bef before it even becomes a product. <laughs> is it possible to talk about end uses in the terms of sustainability or what are end uses for a product that, that would be meaningful for sustainability or or is the the means of production most of you know, is where you are going to get your the bang for your buck for sustainability i can't speak to the bang for your buck that may well exist more on the supply chain side than in the end use or there's certainly there should there's a very live debate there i would think but are there opportunities to drive sustainability through end uses? Absolutely. Things like energy sources uh, that can be replaced at the sort of most obvious end, all the way to uh, the production of biotechnologies that can actually replace existing practices that are, you know, chemical practices or other uh, non-sustainable or actually harmful practices. So I would say yes. And to go back also to the regional definitions, I wonder if there might not be an opportunity to think about end uses and also particular particular risks that are relevant to a regional economy that allow us to more effectively uh, encourage a baseline requirement that some ecosystem-based approach, which drives resilience, is included in a regional definition. So to put a finer point on that, let's think about coastal erosion, catastrophic megafire, over-reliance on corn and, and degradation of soils. You can think about these regional challenges. How might we use that reality as a way to encourage a baseline requirement around sustainability within a regional definition and use that as a place to workshop or to think through or to understand a more limited scope of definition that does encourage and incentivize sustainability as a piece of the economy? So, so yes, and. Anything to add for, to that? Um, yeah, I'll just quickly add, and this is part of a, a question I was sort of answering in the chat. Uh, John Roberts, who also kind of asked about whether we could treat the bioeconomy less as an ends and more of a means to other outcomes, sort of hearkening to that comment I said earlier about international collaboration, about, you know, using biology and, and biotechnology as a means to to improve their their quality of life. I think this kind of goes somewhat related also to to thinking about the sustainability of the process versus or the product versus the end life and, and the uses. And I agree with Teal that it sort of has to be both. Like I think we can't just necessarily look at, you know, the the process of making something, right? Like if we if we take a car, for example, like take making a car is not the is not going to then consider like all of the gasoline and, and fossil fuels that gets burned in its use and sort of the difficulties with recycling it and the sort of actual like volume of, of waste it generates at, at its end life. And so I think for, for biology in general, right, because biological processes and biological bio-based products have sort of a more inherent circularity in them, um, or at least they hopefully will be designed with more inherent circularity in them, I think thinking about both the process and the whole life cycle particularly for bioeconomy uh, or bio-based products is going to be really important to understand not just their value for the economy and for quality of life, but also ensuring that we don't sort of ignore or just brush away any negative externalities that they might have simply because they're biological, right? I think that's that's certainly something that's easy to do of like, oh, it's it's natural, it's it's biocompostable or what have you, but it doesn't mean that that's like certainly a, a get out of jail free card in terms of the impact. And so I guess I'll just maybe end on that note that, you know, it's, I have a, a really high hope for the bioeconomy as being a more um, a sustainable and renewable and, and circular and, and positive impact on the world. Um, but we should constantly be asking ourselves that the things that and the choices that we're making do have that positive impact and trying to measure them the best way that we can to make sure that we don't just flash a, a little green card and, and go on our merry way and then find ourselves in, in sort of the same pickle 30 years down the road. Right. Well, thanks, Hanny. Um, that seems like a really great uh, way to to end the, the webinar. That was a, a good wrap up, I think, of some of the ideas that we've been talking about. 
Um, we are at we are at the end of our time. I want to uh, thank the panelists in particular for their perspectives uh, at the webinar and also for their broader work in this area. Um, thanks also to the the audience. I keep the conversation going. We want to continue talking about the intersections between sustainability and the bioeconomy. Um, and along those lines, you know, watch this space. We at FAS will have uh, an additional webinar in the coming months on that intersection of the bioeconomy with sustainability. So uh, we will keep in touch about that. So thanks everybody. Um, I hope you have a great rest of your day.